risk of recession, increasing the Fed interest rate, trying to curb the inflation that we're seeing. This, ladies and gentlemen, encapsulates the state of the economy today. Inflation is basically too much money chasing too few goods. Too much money chasing too few goods. So as you can imagine, it's a supply and demand issue. And as a result of too much money chasing too few goods, the prices of the goods go up. Where did the money come from? Well, the money came from the pumping of liquidity, the pumping of cash into the system by the Fed through quantitative easing and also through stimulus packages over the past couple of years as a result of the pandemic and other things. So a lot of money came into the system. And while it was coming in, we did know, we did anticipate that inflation was going to follow. And now we're seeing the inflation. The feds are trying to increase the interest rate, make money more expensive, right? Make money more expensive and reduce capital speculation, reduce the amount of money chasing ideas and goods out there so that the Inter, uh, the inflation goes down this basically is what's going on and we're going to be commenting on the remarks by mr peter marisi mr peter marisi is an economist in university of maryland let's see what he has to say and we'll be providing some commentary as we go along here briefly this is peter marisi of the university of maryland he's their economics professor emeritus also a columnist and joining us now to talk about matters of the economy good morning sir good morning uh we will see the federal reserve meet this week uh what's your expectation as far as future of rate hikes i think they'll raise rates a half a point and i think they'll tell us to expect another half a point but you the usual caveats this depends on data i think one of the things the federal reserve is learning or at least jay powell is learning but maybe not the other governors is to say less about the future, because in order to predict where you're going, you have to know where we're going to be. And if they've learned anything over the last two years, is they're not very good at forecasting where we're going to be. And these happen every six weeks. Mm -hmm. And so the data is full of surprises in this. He's starting to realize it. If you look at his most recent speech, uh, it, was, it, was, it was much more sanguine than the kinds of things he was saying a year ago. Uh, he's, he's learned the disabilities of being an economist. The lawyer can make reality whatever he wants it to be, as long as he can get 12 people to believe it, or maybe a, you know, a, a mediator. A, an economist says things, and then the world goes and does what it pleases. Uh, as far as the hikes themselves, do you think they're a good thing? Yes, I do. I think that we have not been aggressive enough. Everybody talks about, oh my God, we're raising rates so fast. Paul Volcker raised them one percentage point a month. He didn't even wait the six weeks. He would call, we have special. Paul Volcker was raising rates back in the 70s and 80s in order to curb the inflation that was going on back then, okay? Paul Volcker was the Fed chairman back then, and he increased rates in order to curb the inflation that was going on back then, and that's what's being referred to right now. Special meetings on the phone. We are in a very difficult inflationary situation. It is getting very much embedded in wage negotiations and so forth. And we're not taking this seriously enough. It's going to take a great deal of good luck, better luck than even Bismarck said America has, to get down to 2%. After Paul Volcker's draconian program, he got it down to 4% and it stayed there for like about four years. He never got it down to 2 Is 2 a magic number? And why not make it higher than that? Well, inflation itself has terrible corrosive effects on innocent people. For example, the elderly. You just can't have all your money in the stock market when you're older. Most of us don't have benefit-defined pensions, so you got to have at least half in fixed income. If you look at the interest rates that fixed income has paid in recent years, if you've got 5% inflation outside, plus taxes and all the rest on what you earn, you're getting clobbered by inflation. The other thing is inflation distorts decision-making. It would be optimal to have it at zero, but because of institutional constraints, it's often been viewed that zero is an impossible number to hit. Let's talk about what he just said. Basically, inflation helps those people who are in the speculative assets that are being inflated. If you have a home, a house, a property, and the inflation, the housing market is inflating, it helps you. If you have speculative assets or, you know, securities, equities, stocks, whatnot, things that are a little risky and you have an inflationary environment, well, then it helps you as well. But if you're elderly and you have to put your money somewhere safe, okay, where there's a low interest rate and whatnot, inflation does not help you. Inflation hurts you. Now, as to why we need inflation in the first place, well, that's basically simple. The idea is you need to grow. You need to grow. And as 
in order to grow, you need to borrow from the future. So if you're a household, you're a business, you want to grow, you say, hey, Mr. Credit Card, give me some money. Or hey, Mr. Fed, print some money, do some quantitative easing, add some money to the system. Okay, that's where the money comes in. And in the future, we'll grow into it and we'll be able to pay our bills with interest. Hence, the money supply keeps increasing. That is why you cannot have in a monetary system such as we do have, you cannot have a 0% inflation and have the system work. That's the idea. I don't agree with that, but most people do think you have to have some inflation for the system to function. And so 2% is sort of a kind of a rough ballpark thing. You know, it's kind of like in baseball, uh, you know, if you're a run behind in the eighth inning, uh, you, 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 you basically uh, pull out your pitcher and you, you, well, I'm getting dated here. They don't do that anymore. And you put in a pinch hitter. But if you're a run ahead and the pitcher's doing pretty good, you leave them alone. That's the 2% rule. Uh, is if you had to look at factors saying, okay, here are the things that have to happen to keep hikes low and to, to keep them pulled back, what would you have to see economically? Well, I have to see things that are beyond the Federal Reserve's control. Remember, inflation is about too much money chasing too few goods. So you have two sides. You have the money side, the money supply side, the money that's in the system right? And the cost of that money. So the Fed can do things like, well, let's make that money more expensive. Let's go ahead and increase the interest rate so that people are not pouring so much money, so that people hoard their money a little bit more, so that people are not making speculations uh, on Bitcoin and hiking up the price of Bitcoin and hiking up the price of everything. So asset prices typically will reduce, as we've seen, the raising of the interest rates has definitely affected the prices of the stock market other speculative assets such as Bitcoin and what have you. But also there is a side of the goods being produced because again, it's about too much money chasing too few goods. And on the side of the goods being produced, there's certain things like what's going on in Russia or what's going on in China, right? If Apple needs to take away the manufacturing of their iPhones, okay, of their iPhones from Foxconn in China, it's going to cost more, okay? If the deglobalization trend continues, whereby people are trying to diversify their supply chain. If this diversification of supply chain continues, then things are going to be more expensive. Okay. So these are the economic factors that affect the inflation numbers that he is commenting on. Let's continue. For example, global warming. I mean, we have people out there who say it's poo poo. It's with us. I've been to the glaciers. I'm a conservative. I'd like to believe that Al Gore is wrong, uh, is a real thing. And it is changing the agriculture cycle in all of the major grain producers. And as a consequence, we're facing escalating food prices no matter what we do. Uh, the geopolitical situation in Ukraine, and also with regard to China and Taiwan, it's, we now have to recognize that any morning we could wake up and Taiwan heats up and all the rest of that nonsense. So what is that doing? It's causing people to decouple. The other thing is that President Z is behaving like a paranoid leader. And that is having significant consequences for the Chinese supply chain, which means our supply chain. Remember that? The supply chain, the supply of goods. If you're going to diversify, move away from China because China is acting a little weird right now, the prices will necessarily go up because you're moving into a more inefficient system. It's very efficient to get all your stuff from one place like China. And then China perfects it. Everything is perfectly efficient. But when you need to diversify, in this case, because of some geopolitical concerns, then you will increase the cost. You will be more robust overall, but there's going to be an increased cost, which leads to the inflation of the particular things in concern here. With that in mind, people are basically the, adopting what the Europeans call uh, for China only. And that is you're only producing China for China and the, otherwise get out. And that's what that's what iPhone is doing. Well, whenever you look at where uh, iPhone can go. Wherever Foxconn can take that production, it's going to be more expensive, but it reduces risk. That sort of thing is inflationary. When Jay Powell says, not his last speech, he didn't say this, but the one before he did, mm -hmm. we have all the tools we need. I'd like to know, to curb inflation, to harness this beast, I'd like to know how raising interest rates is going to do something about Presidents Putin and Xi, global warming in the agriculture cycle, and the machinations of labor negotiations. 
again, too much money chasing too few goods, too much money chasing too few goods. That is the, those are the size of the equation here. So what can the Fed affect and what can the Fed not affect? The Fed can affect the stock market. Okay, when the Fed increases prices, uh, increases interest rates, basically people stop investing because they remove their money from risk assets, right? And they can now go into less risky assets such as bonds who now have a better interest rate, right? The idea is money is more expensive. You cannot afford to be as speculative. It is not the time of free money printing, Fed printer go brr, right? We remember the meme and the kinds of things that we saw during the pandemic, quantitative easing, stimulus, and so on and so forth. The Fed can reverse that, okay, and say, hey, I'm going to bring down the price of Bitcoin and all these stocks by increasing the interest rate, making money less liquid, less flowy, if you will, and people make less speculations in that regard. However, the Fed cannot affect these other supply side things, such as what Russia is going to do and such as what China is going to do, and the general deglobalization that we'll see as a result of the pandemic. The pandemic showed certain cracks in the very efficient globalization scheme, and now people are going to try to de diversify. You don't just want all your pharmaceuticals coming from China, or Apple doesn't just want to make its phones only in one place. Maybe I'll go make it in Vietnam and other places. This increases inefficiency, but overall increases robustness. And this increases prices in general. The Fed doesn't really have direct control of these prices, but it does when it comes to speculative assets like the stock market and whatnot. I just don't buy it. Uh, our guest with us until 10 o'clock. If you have questions for him, you can call the lines 202-748-8001 for Republicans, 202-748-8001 for Democrats, and 20, I'm sorry, 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8002 for Independents. You can text us at 202-748-8003. The Treasury Secretary was on 60 Minutes, talked about the possibility of recession, also related that to inflation. I want to play a little bit of what he had, she had to say. Sure. Get your thoughts. There are always risks of a recession. The economy remains prone to shocks. Um, but look, we have a very healthy banking system. We have very healthy business and household so you don't, sector. You have said this. You do not believe there will be a recession next year. There's a risk of recession, but um, it certainly isn't, in my view, something that is necessary to bring. There's always a risk. There's always a risk. She's being rather political here. There's always a risk, obviously. And she's going to state that she does not think that recession will be necessary in order to bring down the inflation. Again, too much money chasing too few goods. Recession means people are broke. When people are broke and they don't have money to buy those goods, the prices of those goods is going to come down. That's the idea. But she's saying, hey, maybe we're not going to need a recession in order to deal with this runaway inflation. Let Bring us continue. Inflation down. Just a portion of her comments from last night. Well, you have to remember that she is in a political position. It's her job to support the president of the United States. So it's very prudent to say there's always a risk of recession. But could I die? You could always have a heart attack. But for some people, the prospects are much more likely than others. Uh, prospects for a recession are, are, are more likely for America, just like they are a heart attack is for someone who smokes. For the last several years, we have really juiced the economy with a lot of liquidity. We can get into whether that was prudent or imprudent. Juice the economy with a lot of liquidity. Again, too much money chasing too few goods. That's a simple formula to think about when you think about inflation. Let's continue. But basically, these spending programs to get through the recession were very expensive, and we printed money to do it, and that's giving us this inflation. We don't have to have a recession if we're willing to tolerate 5% inflation, or perhaps even 4 because they can just quit raising rates when we get down to 4 If we want to get down to 2%, the risk of a recession is much greater. I don't know that Janet Yellen would be saying things quite the way she's saying them if she was still chairman of the Federal Reserve or indeed if she was back in private academic life. But one always has to take with a grain of salt what people say when they're working for the administration on either side. When you're talking about inflation, the people point the guy, guy post all the time, gasoline prices, milk prices, et cetera. How do you view those when those, those topics, those guideposts come up? 
Well, you know, they're giving you all this stuff about expectations and whatnot. You know, the Federal Reserve has got this index that indexes all the indexes of expectations. The average guy, average woman, they do two things every week. They fill up their car and they go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. To them, there's a lot of inflation outside, at least at the grocery store. Now, gas prices have edged back. But there's another important example of something beyond this control. The president has drained well over 40 percent of the strategic petroleum reserve to keep oil prices down. He's also spent the first year or so of his presidency sending very strong signals to oil companies that after the people that manufacture cigarettes, you come next and we want you out of business. So no reasonable executive in that business is going to sink cash into new refining capacity. We had three major refineries closed the year before the president became, came to office. No one's interested in replacing those. As a consequence, no matter how much oil we have, we can only get so much diesel because we don't have capacity to refine it. That is well beyond the control of the Federal Reserve and blame for some of that does lie squarely with this president. However, I would say this, if Donald Trump were in the White House now, if he'd managed to get elected for a second term, I suspect there'd be a lot of blame over there too right now because he was not a model of fiscal restraint. Uh, basically, Mr. Biden likes to do it with entitlement programs like we're gonna extend forever these pandemic emergency measures on things like food stamp eligibility and so forth. Whereas by now, I'm sure the gang at the West Wing would be coming. Larry Kudlow and company would have a new tax cut that would also pay for itself. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So the idea here, whether you're talking about taxing and spending on the one end or cutting taxes and then expecting the system to kind of repay for it, right? There is a general let us spend, spend, spend attitude when it comes to the federal government, the executive branch that is. Now, again, we're talking about the risk of recession. We're talking about the increase in the interest rates in order to try to curb the inflation that we're seeing inflation being too much money chasing too few goods liquidity was pumped into the system in the past couple of years quantitative easing stimulus spend 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 we know why that happened and we watched while it happened and we understood that there will be a risk of inflation now we're trying to curb that by increasing the cost of money Putting more friction in the path of liquidity is a way to think about it, increasing the rate. So people will pull out of risk assets, pull out of the stock market, as you're seeing. Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, everything dropping down, people being less speculative with their money. They can make actually a decent amount now, putting in, in things such as T-bills and um, the bonds, basically, have now better interest rates. So why would I put it in the stock market? and other kinds of speculative assets, assets and risk assets and whatnot. And we also learned that there are certain things on the supply side, right? On the manufacturing of goods side, on the deglobalization side, on Apple trying to make its iPhones elsewhere side of things, on Russia uh, and oil and all those other sides of things that also affect the inflation story. Because again, it's about the goods and the money. So ladies and gentlemen, what are your thoughts? How are you feeling the inflation what do you think about the chances for recession do you think that the fed will be able to curb it okay and how do we handle going forward the deglobalization trend the trend whereby we're going to be diversifying our supply chain not just de depending only on china or depending only on one thing generally speaking but you know moving manufacturing over to mexico taiwan uh vietnam and what have you but anyways, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great one. Until next time, thank you very much. This is Aiko Gyamin. Peace out.